how to resolve conflict and restore relationship. That's my message today. Now, friends, one of the most important life skills that we will ever learn in life is conflict resolution skills. Amen. Why do relationships go up in smoke, so to speak? Why are there so many problems in our relationships? And I'm talking about work relationship, relationship on the job, yes, relationship also in the home, relationships in the church. What's the reason why there is so much problem because what many people don't know how to resolve conflicts. You see, friends, in this, on this family life day, I want to say this. That in our homes, we will always have conflicts. Is that right? There are no perfect marriages. There is no perfect family. There will always be conflicts. So the problem is not that we have conflicts, but it is how we resolve those conflicts. And by the way, did you know it is possible to resolve the conflict so well that the latter part of the relationship is better than before? In other words, the relationship is better after the conflict than it was before. And so our duty, our responsibility is to learn the proper techniques in how to resolve conflicts. Is that right? Now, there is another problem that people have today that they sometimes regard or they, 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 they treat with uh, not much significance, scant regard. And it is that they learned conflict resolution skills from the wrong sources. And they make no effort to do things differently or to learn things differently. And they do marriage by default based on what they learned, number one, from their upbringing. We saw our mom and dad always in power struggle, fighting and quarreling, bickering, always holding grudge, keeping malice. And so the children grow up and watch us now. Children live what they learn. And so they grow up and in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, the siblings are still fighting with one another. Why? Because that's what they saw and that's how they learned to resolve conflicts from their family of origin. So if, those, if what you learn from your family, if those patterns of communication, if those skills were skewed or messed up or broken, then when you get in and have your own family, you only replicate what you learned. And the vicious cycle continues. No wonder I hear God saying we must change that. We must break the cycle. And the only way to do that, we must unlearn some things and we must learn some new things. Is that right? The Bible puts it beautiful. He says, cease to do evil and learn to do well. Isaiah says in chapter 1. And so there is a place for learning. And this is why some people they say, well, why should I do marriage counseling? Why should I do premarital counseling? Do you know why? Because a lot of what we learned is messed up. And we must unlearn some things so we, can, and we, so we can learn some new things. If not, 
we enter a relationship and we only bring pain and heartache to our husband or our wife and we damage our children. For we are only replicating a vicious cycle. So there are four areas, my friends, that we learned about how to do relationship. Four areas primarily. Number one, our family of up upbringing. Number two, what we learn from the media. Some people, the only book they have is the media. And so they decide, oh, this is how to do relationship. And if what they learned in the media was wrong, then their relationship become messed. So, number one, family. Number two, media. Number three, friends. The friends, my friends, peer pressure is not only for children. Adults. Adults, have, adults are victims of peer pressure, too. Man, I'm not going to. I wouldn't take that, man. You know, I'm going home to my old lady. They said, well, I don't know what she's going to say. After a while, you start to call your wife my old lady, too. You know, you heard the talk on the streets. They talk, call your wife, yeah, my old lady, you know, and so forth. Oh, my baby mother. I mean, we pick up language along the way. Because that's how our friends, that's the vernacular they use. Many learn from their friends. Oh, I'm going to go home and divorce him because my friend say she wouldn't take that and I don't know why I should take it either. <laughs> Did you know that a lot of relationships end in divorce because of what the friends say? Some learned about how to do marriage from their friends. So number one, our upbringing. Number two, the media. Number three, our friends. Number four, books we read as well. And of course, there are other sources. Some learn as well from the church and other sources and schools and so forth. But those four basic areas. Do you understand then, friends, why we must become diligent students of marriage education if we are to change the wrong patterns into new ways of relating. Amen. What's a relationship, by the way? What is it that determines the quality of a relationship? Do you know what relationship really means? How you relate. Amen. That's what a relationship is all about. How you relate to each other. So how you relate to your spouse will determine the quality of your marriage. How we relate. That's what relationship is about. And therefore now, we must learn how to resolve conflicts in relationship. Um, so what's this, friend? So if we are to live and interact successfully with people, learning how to resolve conflicts is crucial. In marriage, your, our ability to resolve conflicts will determine whether we will be able to maintain the relationship. It's all about how we resolve conflicts. Conflicts, is that right? Now, three, three things happen when we fail to resolve conflicts. Number one, we become distant. Oh, we are in the house with the same person and we don't talk for days. Oh, oh, oh that doesn't happen these days. Maybe like in some places around the world, you know. Yeah, days. Weeks. Because we don't know how to resolve conflicts. So we become distant. Number three. We, you see, so we live emotionally distant from the person who we should be close to. Number two. We become demanding. You know, I tell you to do that. Why you don't do that? We become demanding. Number three. We become defensive. Three things happen. When we fail to resolve conflicts well. We become distant. We become, we become demanding. And we become defensive. Never admitting. Always defending our turf. And so we never resolve the conflicts. 
You see, friends, unresolved conflicts damage our lives. I want to share with you four ways in which unresolved conflicts damage our lives. Number one, unresolved conflicts blocks my relationship with God. Amen. <laughs> Did you know that? Our relationship with people is inextricably bound to our relationship with God. In other words, you cannot be right with God and wrong with people. If you say you love your brother, hello today, whom you see, but you watch this now. In other words, put it this way. If you say you love God, whom you do not see, but you say you love your brother, whom you see. You know what the Bible says there? You say you hate your brother, whom you see. But we say we love God, whom we don't see. The truth is not in us. And so, we must first of all, we must learn to love each other here. Isn't that right? We must learn to love each other here. So it blocks my relationship with God. First John 4 and verse 20. We cannot love God while hating people. Number two, blocks our prayers. Did you know unresolved conflicts blocks our prayers? Oh yes, First Peter 3 and verse 7. The Bible reminds especially those in the family. Mm-mm-mm. What does the Bible say there? First Peter 3 and verse 7. Can you help me with that text here? First Peter 3 and verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands. And if you can just put the text on the screen for me, please, as I go along, that would be so beautiful. What does it say there? Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And what? And as being ears together of the grace of life. Why? That your prayers be not hindered. Oh, you didn't get that. Did you know a wrong relationship with your spouse can cause God to block his ears when you pray? Amen. So our relationship with God is connected to our relationship with people. Did you know there are some who hurt their spouse? Hurt their spouse so bitterly. And then they get up in the morning, you know, and they grab their Bible. I'm going to church. And they do not care about those at home. Let them stay there and suffer. They deserve it. But yet they are going to the house of worship. But I hear God saying something today. In Matthew 5, there's a passage they want to read for you. In Matthew 5, you know what God says there? God says, verse 23, he says... Therefore, if thou bring thy gifts to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother, thy wife, thy husband has aught against thee, what he says, leave your gifts at the altar and go and reconcile to them. And then you come again. In other words, in God's economy, the relationship with your brother. And watch this now. Reconciling with your fellow man is more important than worship. Amen. Reconciling with your brother or your sister is more important than worship. In other words, God says, give that priority. You come to pray, you come to worship, it's not worship time. Leave your goods. Give your offering, you know, leave your offering. Don't go with it, leave it, right? Leave your offering here, okay? Then go home. And make it right. Fix it with them. Okay? And you go home, and when you go home, you fall on your knees. 
And you say, you know, I'm sorry for hurting you. I think I was just so selfish at that point. What can I do to make it right? That's the godly way, isn't that right? We possess humility. Amen? We possess humility. Ellen White says about 95% of the, of the marital conflicts can be resolved if we only possessed humility. Some folk are so filled with so much pride that they will not even say, I'm sorry. God cannot even soften their heart, get to their heart. Heart is tough as a rock because they're on a pride trap. Pride. Why do you think, for example, in Russia today, thousands, of lives are being snuffed out by war. Did you know that the Bible says the, the, the primary cause of conflicts is pride? This man, Vladimir Putin, finds it difficult to step back. No, I must win it. I must not show that I'm a loser. I must continue going forward. will not back down. Pride. The primary cause of war and conflicts. But as godly people, we learn humility. Amen. Humility. Did you know sometimes even in your marriage you have to say, I'm sorry, even though you don't even know why you're saying I'm sorry. Amen. For you're a peacemaker, is that right? Amen. God has given us what? The ministry of reconciliation. We must be people of peace. When, when resolving conflicts, one thing is on our mind, and it is healing. How to heal the relationship. How to heal the relationship. And so this is, and so friends, no, unresolved conflicts, what? Blocks my relationship with God, number one. It blocks our prayers. God cannot hear. Number three, blocks our happiness. Amen. I'm going to tell them a piece of my mind. Did you know there's a principle in life? We reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. As a matter of fact, we normally reap more than we sow. You sow a grain of corn, <laughs> you're going to get corn on the cob. Hundreds of little corns. Just as you sow it. We normally get more than we sow. So you sow gossip, reap gossip. You sow pain and heartache and verbal and financial and mental and psychological abuse to your spouse. You get the same. You just call your spouse derogatory names and you left for work. Then you come home, <laughs> where is the dinner? Really? You haven't, you, haven't, you haven't apologized yet? There are many who hurt others and expect that the relationship is going to be reconciled, brought back into a state of health and normalcy without apology. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. You are going to be living a lie. In the home with somebody that you are always estranged to. For there is no mending of the relationship. And so there is no blending of the hearts. If you hurt people, don't expect that you can restore the relationship. Except 
you apologize. Amen. But when we apologize, mm -mm 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 -mm. apology has the power, my friends, to melt away bitterness. Amen. Amen. To melt away resentment like the butter against sun. Isn't that right? Melt away resentment. And open the heart for reconciliation. We must learn how to resolve conflicts. So unresolved conflicts blocks our happiness. How can you every day get up? With only bitterness in your heart. Telling off everybody you meet. Vilifying everybody. Berating them. Discrediting them. Dehumanizing them. Assassinating them with your words. And expect that you are going to go to bed. And have a peaceful nightmare. Hello? No, you go to bed and you keep staring in the, in the roof. All night long. For the heart is not at rest. Unresolved conflicts blocks our happiness. For we reap what we sow. Therefore, there is reason to watch carefully how we relate to people. General principle, my friends, to observe when resolving conflicts. We must take a solution-focused approach when resolving conflicts. We must, have, we must have restorative conversation. What it means is that before I even get upset, I start to evaluate how am I going to heal the relationship after I get upset. <laughs> we must always be thinking about healing. How am I going to heal the relationship after I get upset? So you don't just speak anything that comes to your mind. For in your mind, you're thinking, how am I going to heal it? So you have what we call restorative conversation. Amen. And you have one thing in your heart. How am I going to heal the relationship? How am I going to heal the relationship? You see, friends, love is like a tender plant, easily damaged if not treated with tender loving care. Amen. You know, friends, it always amazes me how freely people hurt one another. With their words. How easily, how nonchalantly, how effortlessly they speak words to hurt one another. In God's economy, we should have the mentality of healing, always seeking to heal the relationship. So, friends, watch this now. I want to share with you very quickly. I just itemized them. I won't be able to go through them in detail. Six ways to resolve conflicts. Number one. Number one. Make the first move. Amen. What about that? That's the topic of my message today. Make the first move. Reconciliation in a relationship is more important than worship. What does the Bible say? Leave your gifts at the altar. Is that right? So Christians, I'm not going to go to them before they come to me. For they hurt me first. God is saying, make the first move. You come to worship, leave your gifts at the altar and go. Did you know there are many people, friends, who have been embittered, embittered for years with others. They are waiting for you. They don't know, the unchristian man doesn't even know how to make the first move towards reconciliation. 
His heart is not conditioned like that. But the Christian, that's his role. For God lives in the heart. So God is saying, go, make the first move. There are many people, they would be so happy if you just come to them and make the first move. They say, I've been waiting for 20 years for this. God sent you today. You just lift a burden off my heart. Helping me to live again. Just for coming to me today. God is saying, we are Christians. We know what's right. We have the prescription. So make the first move. Leave your gifts at the altar. You know, friends, one of the things I observe with prayer. <laughs> oh, if this morning coming in the car, I was just rehearsing to myself. I said, I must write a quote on this. No man is greater than his prayer life. Amen. No Christian is greater than his prayer life. When you have a prayer life, you cannot harbor grudge. In your soul. For when you lie before God. And your soul is laid bare. Before the inspecting eye of the living God. And you know God is looking down in your soul. And you cannot pretend. For God will not be fooled. Amen. And you desire intensely to receive his blessing. His spirit in your soul. The first thing he's going to lead you to do is to say, Lord, cleanse me. Cleanse me. Without God, there is no blessing without true repentance. Amen. Cleanse me of all sins. If I hurt somebody, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And when you get up from that prayer session, One thing on your heart is to make it right with them. So no Christian is greater than his prayer life. <laughs> Hello, you say you are a Christian? Tell me about your prayer life. Amen. Amen. Hello, watch this now. Oh, friends, you want to be a good Christian? Be a good prayer. Amen. Amen. That will ensure that we make the first move. Number two, number two, the next step in resolving conflicts. Take responsibility for at least a part of the problem. Amen. But I, I wasn't the one who was wrong. Hello, friend. Did you know if we look clearly, if it's even 1%, we can find where we can take responsibility. Is that clear? Take responsibility for even a part of the problem. Exercise humility. 95% of conflicts can be resolved when we possess humility. So begin with, what is my fault in this matter? Dispense with the ego trap. Is that right? And go to them and say, you know... I think I was just being thoughtless. I wasn't thinking at the time. Maybe I was just being selfish. Please forgive me. Is that clear? Humility. Take the place of humility. And that can help to break down a multitude of sins. Take responsibility for even a part of the problem. Number three. Listen to their hurt and perspective. Listen to their hurt and perspective. I want to say something about that. 
Did you know, friends, if we are serious about resolving conflicts with other people, we must listen to their perspective. Amen. Did you know that there are some who draw conclusions before they hear the full story? Notice, three evenings, three weeks in a row, you're coming home late. And when you come home, you don't even want to have any dinner. You don't like my food anymore. Huh? And I know why. Because you have been eating elsewhere. And you have, hey, hey you're seeing somebody else. I know that's what happened. And the husband said, well, you know, don't say, no, there's no, 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 no. I know it. What's happening? Nobody gives me an opportunity to talk. I don't want to hear it. I know it. What's happening? Three weeks? It's enough. It's enough to charge you. friend told me of an attorney. I'm going there tomorrow. Well, give me a chance to explain. No, it's over. And we will not listen to the full story. Watch this. Listen to them. I want to share with you a text that I sometimes share with people. Sometimes it, 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 it shocks them. I said, the Bible really said that? Yes. About listening. Did you know that listening is a big problem in relationships? People find it difficult to listen. Proverbs 18 and verse 13. Can you put that on the screen? Proverbs 18 and verse 13. And sometimes when I pull up that text... Sometimes I even not my doing my virtual sessions, you know. I like the virtual sessions because I can pull it up on the computer in different versions, different renderings of the Bible. And I, and I teach it and show what God says in different renderings, in different wording. He that answereth a matter. He that answereth a matter. Too quick to answer. Yo, you don't hear this story? Yeah, just ready to answer. He that answereth a matter. Before he listens, before he heareth it, the Bible says, you are foolish. He says, it is folly. Not only that, he says, it is shameful of you. God says, oh, you should listen. Some other versions of the Bible, he says, he, if, you, if you answer a matter before you listen, you are an embarrassment, you are a disgrace. The Bible uses some strong language. I want you to go home and study that text in different renderings of the Bible. In other words, it's one of the worst indictments upon a human being. To draw a conclusion. Hello today. To make assumption of people before you listen to the full story. Did you know today many are in jail? Serving many years sentence, even life sentence. Because nobody gave them an opportunity <laughs> so they can express the full story. It's a dangerous thing. And so, friends, there is no perfect person on this earth. Whenever you identify that something is wrong, it's time to zip. Tighten the lips and listen. Listen to their hurt and perspective. And do you know why we should listen? And when we listen, 
we listen not just to what they say, we listen to the motivation behind what they say. But sometimes they don't say it all. But we listen to what it is that ignites and motivates their words. But watch this now. The true meaning is normally behind the rhetoric. Amen. So we listen. You know why we should also listen? By listening, we'll discover that that person hurt us because they have been hurt themselves. My mother treated me abusively. My stepdad abused me in different ways. There's a technique sometimes we use in therapy. We call it the empty chair. The stepdad might be dead and gone. But you put yourself in their perspective. Let them talk. While you listen. And you talk to them as well. When you talk. As though they are the ones talking. Then you get an opportunity to rehearse. What they went through. And then you are filled with. Empathy. And sympathy. And then you start to forgive your own self. Friends watch this. It is hurt people that hurt people. What was it that hurt them that caused them to hurt me? We must listen for that. When we listen, we listen for that. And then that will help us to be more considerate in dealing with them. So we listen. We listen. <laughs> There's another quote I want to write that says, be a lover of the truth. Don't just run with the herd and have a herd mentality. Oh, they said it, so it's got to be right. Not always. Everybody's saying it, so it's got to be right. No, get the truth for yourself. As a pastor, I learned it well before I even disfellowship folk. I like to meet them. Sometimes I go up in the hills, down the valleys, and search for them. I say, okay, let's postpone this a little. Give me some time to find them. When I hear their story, it helps me to think. And it helps, it gives me a different perspective sometimes. There is something about understanding the full story before we act. There are some people, friends, who assume things. They make assumptions of people and that's how they live. Somebody told me you are like that, so you've got to be like that. <laughs> one woman once said to Churchill, Chur she said, you know, I see that man over there, you see that man over there, I hate him. Churchill said to her, you know, before you say that, get to know him. Amen. Get to know him. And when you know him, you know, some people sometimes just hate you just by, by seeing you. They just hate you just to see you. I hate him. I just see her and I just hate her. Watch this. When you get to know them, many times you may discover they are the nicest people in the world. Listen to their hurt 
and perspective. Number four, number four, uh, uh, techniques in resolving conflicts. Number four, speak the truth tactfully. Amen. What about that one? Oh, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. No, 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 no. It is not just about what you say, but it's how you say it. Hello today. You have the gospel, and the gospel is right. But if you say it the wrong way, you may lose a soul. It's not just about saying it, what you say, but it's about how you say it. Do everything to preserve love. What can separate me from the love of God? Two imperfect people cannot make a perfect marriage. So set some ground rule. Be sympathetic with each other. It's not just to speak it. One man puts it this way. He says, you are never persuasive when you are abrasive. Hello? Some folk are wrong. I'm going to tell them as it is. And let the splinters fall where they may. Not when you're dealing with the fragile human heart. I've seen people in their 50s and 60s who cannot recalibrate, who cannot rebound into healthy living. Because when they were young, the things their parents told them. Were so hard. And like a self-fulfilling prophecy, they became just what they were told they would become. There's a statement right now, Ellen White said, Ellen White made a statement. She says, even the idle talk, <laughs> you know, we sometimes can hurt each other, even in a joke. She says, this, this, this joking, censuring, bantering of one another, it wounds. She says, the wound may be concealed. They may not talk about it. But nevertheless, the wound exists. And peace is sacrificed. And happiness endangered. Oh, I could spend some time on that if I had time, friends. Every word we say, even in a jest, <laughs> we should be careful of it. Is that clear? Some people even call it comedy. Oh, it's comedy. It's comedy. Even in comedy, friends, watch this one. You saw the other day? Yeah, one man got a slap, right? Oh, you don't know about that. You don't, you don't watch those things, right? Oh, it's a little joke I'm making. Friends, that can destroy relationships. <laughs> Speak the truth tactfully. You never get your point across by being cross. <laughs> Some people always cross, right? Yeah. Wake up in the morning, they are cross. In the daytime, they will touch them. In the nighttime, danger. And if the sheet catch them, they think he's a, he's a mighty warrior. 
And they get up and they are cursing. Speak the truth tactfully. So don't, Proverbs 12, 18, don't be reckless with our words. Reckless words pierce like a sword. Foolish words hurt, but wise words heal. What do you say? Amen. If you say it offensively, it will be received defensively. Ephesians 4, 29. Don't use harmful words. But use helpful words. Amen. Number five. Number five. Number five. Resolving conflicts. Attack problem, not people. Amen. Oh, my time is gone. Oh, another uh, half part two. I can explain, explain further about that. Attack problem, not people. Something happened in their home, in the family. And you don't see the problem anymore. You see the person. You do that. You always, you never do anything good. You're always wrong. You dress like you. Just like your granny and your granddad, eh? Attacking people. When you have problems, well, let me tell my folk, when you have problems, avoid using that you statement. Oh, you never do anything. Why you do that? What happened to you? What happened to your head? They don't stop there. Ah, oh, something eating out your brain. What? Are, and they keep. So avoid the you statement. Is that clear? You, 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 you. Every time you use that you statement, you strike a dagger to their heart. For they feel attacked. As though their character is on the line. And every man has to live with himself 24-7. When a person feels attacked, they're going to spend their life defending themselves. And so the problems never de-escalate. Only get worse. But instead, watch this. What do we do? What do we do? Instead of using the you statement... Use the I statement. Is that clear? When you use the I statement, you are really expressing how you feel. Is that right? And nobody can deny how I feel. What do you say? You can get your point across, but you never attack anybody. For example. You never understand me. There's another way to say that. I don't feel that I get my point across when I speak. Did you attack anybody? Did you did, did I attack anybody? No. no. <laughs> I just express how I feel. Did I get the point? Yeah. I don't feel like I'm getting my point across when I speak. You're expressing how you feel. Do you see the psychology, friends? We must be wise. Is that right? Instead of saying, you not listening. Your head. Head is tough on your ears. You're blocked with something. The other person is going to say, me, me, me. What about you, you? And the quarrel, world war just begin. So, attack problem, not 
people. The Bible says, Matthew 12 to 37, for by your words you will be justified. And by your words you will be condemned. The number six, number six. Watch this, friends. Let me tell you a little about that. Let me say something more about attack problem of people. He says, truth without love is resisted. But truth with love is received. What do you say? Amen. Amen. Number six, be ready to forgive and apologize. Amen. Did you hear that? Be ready to forgive and apologize. Be ready to forgive and apologize. Amen. And when you apologize, the apology must be accompanied with a commitment that you won't do it again. There will not be a repeat performance. Amen. Be ready to forgive or apologize as the case may be. Friends, let me tell you this. God wants us to have a good relationship with each other. I agree, friends. Not, not all the time you'll be able to reach them to say, I forgive or suffer. But at least in your heart, you know you're right with God. So leave your goods at the altar. Amen. Isn't that right? Make the first move as Christians. Oh, friends, and as much as the life within us, let us live peaceably with all men, what do you say? May God help us, friends, that we seek a good relationship in our homes, in our church, and at the workplace. The church will be a better place. Our home will be a little heaven on earth. And the world will be impacted with our witness.